Welcome to the virtual living room and salon of Globus Books. Today we're excited and honored to welcome Tanya Amachayev uh, with her new book, 100 Years of Exile. We're really looking forward to this presentation. I personally know Tanya for a number of years from our beloved San Francisco Writers Workshop with Demi Mansari. And um, she's a fabulous writer and uh, an award-winning travel photographer and the author of three books, Mother Tongue, a saga of three generations of Balkan women, Never a Stranger, a travel story collection, and 100 Years of Exile, a Roman search for her father's Russia. A Solace Award winner, Tanya's work has also been featured in multiple travel anthologies and translated into Serbo-Croatian and Russian. Born in the former Yugoslavia, Tanya fled the country and spent her childhood in a refugee camp in Trieste, Italy, before immigrating to the United States. What a journey. She went through San Francisco's public schools, UC Berkeley, and the Stanford Graduate School of Business, eventually serving as CEO of three technology companies. When not on the road, Tanya splits her time between San Francisco and Sonoma County. And we are um, featuring Tanya at Globus Books, uh, which is an independent bookstore serving San Francisco since 1971, so we will be 50 next year. Uh, we offer a wide range and stock of books on all things Russia and the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. We are actively working with the libraries across the states on completing their holdings for Russian publications. And we offer a wide selection of books for children and adults, from poetry translation to prose uh, in translation, Russian avant-garde, early imprints, uh, literature for children, illustrated books, you name it, we got it. I will be introducing Tanya and passing the mic to her. Tanya will be telling us about her new book. And after that, we will have a chance to ask questions. So Tanya, welcome. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you, Serena. How sweet to hear you. Um, and thank you for uh, Globus Bookstore for featuring me. This is really lovely. Um, it was interesting hearing Serena announce me because she's the only one who says my name, Tanya, uh, the way a Russian would. Um, and I've tried to explain that to so many people and they don't get the difference, but I hear it. <laughs> so it's quite lovely. Thank you. How do other people pronounce it, by the way? Yeah. In English, it's Tanya. Now you say it. Tanya. So yeah. Tanya, I will stick to the Russian pronunciation. <laughs> so Tanya, uh, tell us about your book. I will, I will. I need to tell you first that I write as Tanya Romanov, Tanya Romanova. Uh, and I do that because it's my grandmother's maiden name. Uh, and also because Amachayev, which is very easy for a Russian, is impossible for an American. And uh, so I was told to pick a name that people could handle. And um, I was very fortunate with my grandmother. And um, that kind of brings me even to what this book is about. So this is a book of the history of three families over 100 years. And they are Romanov and Amachayev families. Um, the three families are my family, which are the Amachayevs, who left Russia 100 years ago. And then the Roman, and that's my grandmother was a Romanov before she got married. And then the royal Romanovs, the sister of Tsar Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia, whose family also left Russia from Crimea 100 years ago, a little more even, in 1919. And then the third family is a family of Amachayevs, from the same region as my family, from the same background, non-royal, who stayed in Russia. And so we trace those three families for several generations. Um, and we trace Russia for a hundred years. So that's what the book is about. And um, the way it started uh, was that I published a book called Mother Tongue um, about my mother's family. Now, my father, my mother, and I were all refugees as children. I grew up in a refugee camp. 
My mother was a refugee in Croatia and Serbia. My father was a refugee from Russia. And so I wrote a story about my mother's three generations. And the questions kept coming up when I talked about it. And it finally became clear that in that book, my father was almost non-existent. And, um, and I realized that I had to share my father's story. And as I started thinking about that, these very unusual coincidences happened. So one of them was that my daughter, my stepdaughter in Colorado, did a reading for me for my book. And it was at her house, it was a bunch of friends. She introduced me to a woman I hadn't met. It was one of her best friend's mother. And she said, this is Marina. And oh, by the way, you can speak to her in Russian. And I did. And she said, this is Marina Romanova. And um, I said, oh my God, I realize now who I was speaking with. And it was the granddaughter of Tsar Nicholas's sister, Ksenia. Um, and so it was like, this is really strange. I grew up in a very Russian environment, which I'll talk about. And yet I was meeting a family icon. You know, Russians grow up, Russians grow up with pictures of the czar in the living room. And here I was meeting a descendant of his sister in my daughter's living room. And my daughter's very American, nothing to do with Russian, uh, in a small town in Colorado, not a church in San Francisco. So that was kind of the beginning of this almost eerie set of coincidences. I didn't know yet, but it was just the beginning. Um, I went home and I got an email and it was an error email. It was garbage. It was from the Economist magazine. It wasn't for me. I erased it. And then a second one came and I looked at it again and it was to someone called Artyom Amachayev. And uh, so I thought, well, this is really strange. And for no good reason, I emailed it to my brother, Alex, who in Russian is Sasha. And I said, isn't this weird? And Artyom's address was in Moscow. And so I thought, this is funny, my brother will just laugh. My brother said, why don't you find him? Maybe he's a relative. Well, it turns out Amachayev is an extremely rare name. There are no other Amachayevs outside of Russia in the whole world. I've checked for many, many years, none. And so I did. And I connected with Artyom Amachayev, who turns out to be a 30-year-old uh, graduate student um, in a business school. That's why he wanted to read The Economist. And he spelled his name differently than we do. So Russia is, has to be translated phonetically because they use the Cyrillic alphabet. And so when you get to the Latin alphabet, Amochayev could be many ways, and he spells it A-Y-E-V. But the economist left out the Y, and so I got the email. And we connected like that. It was incredible because he looked me up. He found a story I wrote um, on the website, and he wrote back and he said, my family was born very close to where your family came from. Well, what was really incredible was that within 10 days of getting that erroneous email, my entire Russian family in San Francisco was committed to going to Russia to visit with Artyom's family. I mean, we are talking about my brother, Sasha, my cousin, Lena, her two children and her husband and me, all of whom still speak Russian, going to visit a family none of us had ever heard of. Um, and, um, and there we were, we just committed to it. It was really quite incredible. Um, so once that happened, I had to finish the book. It was like, there were too many pieces rolling in and I started writing and, and went crazy. And I started with my grandmother, with Marina's grandmother, with Artyom's great grandmother, um, whom I didn't know I invented her. Um, and, um, and I just started writing the book. Uh, and as I wrote, even more things started coming up. So for example, my grandmother in 1910 refused to marry the man she was supposed to marry. 
And when I did the research, I found out that Princess Ksenia refused to marry the man she was supposed to marry and married someone else instead. So I, I really had fun with writing this. And I needed to finish the book to go to Russia because that was our plan. So now the question is, why was I going to Russia and what were we going to do and what is this all about? And so it turns out that one of the major reasons that I did not write about my father was I was actually, I did not have a good relationship with my father. Um, and I did not have a lot of understanding of who he was and, and what he had been through in his life. Um, and one of my friends said, well, it seems like your father didn't adapt to America as well as your mother or the rest of you. And I said, well, that's right, that's right. My father spent his life basically thinking that he might have to leave America again. And he wanted us to always be prepared to maybe leave America again. Um, that was not who I wanted to be. I wanted to be American. So um, I'm gonna show you uh, just some pictures to sort of put us in perspective um, of who we're talking about. And, um, and then I'll get you to, to what I was growing up with. Grandmother Daria. This is the man she chose to marry, Ivan. This is Shura, my cousin and his father. She's the one that went to Russia with me. This is my Aunt Lee who stayed in Yugoslavia. And this is my uncle Kolya. And this is young Valya who died. So this is when they're in Yugoslavia. And, you know, they may as well be in Russia or in the old Russia, which no longer existed. So they were going to Russian schools in Yugoslavia because they all believed that they had fled Russia temporarily. And so what you see is you see a family who fled Russia when my father was an infant because the revolution came. And they were the white army, which was fighting the Soviet red army and, um, and they lost the war. And my father at the time of that revolution was a baby. Um, and he moved to Yugoslavia and that's where he grew up. And what I didn't appreciate for most of my life and when I talk about it, it really breaks me up even now, is um, he was almost 40 years old. Uh, when they were kicked out of Yugoslavia. So what happened was they fled communism, they go to Yugoslavia. He gets a college education, he becomes an engineer as do his brothers. They start their own engineering company, they're extremely successful. All of a sudden World War II comes, communism comes to Yugoslavia, all kinds of conflicts arise and they get evicted from the country and all of a sudden they're in a refugee camp for four years. And I just did not appreciate what it would mean to be an adult with a wife and two children. It'd be like me. He was as Yugoslavian as I am American. And all of a sudden you're told, that's it, you're done, you're out of here. I don't know how you could ever be confident again. And so that was the man my father was, but I just I didn't have any time for that. That's my father right here with the camera. He was a photographer. That's a Leica camera. He was a very successful man. The Leica is the best camera made. Um, and this is my mother, Zora. This is my aunt, Galia, my grandmother, and my uncle, Shura. Galia and Shura have gotten their visas for America. And so they're leaving. And these three have no idea if they're ever going to leave a refugee camp, where they're going to go if they do. And so this is, to me, one of the most sentimental pictures I could possibly imagine. And that's what they went through. This, however, is another year later, and we do get our visas. And we do get to go to Genoa and take a ship um, and go to America. Um, so that's me, my brother, my father. And here we are in America. Uh, and. We're just a bunch of America, a bunch of Russians in America, uh, 1950s, Cabrillo Street, San Francisco. Um, that's where we were living. And we might as well have been living in Russia. Um, we um, spoke Russian at home. We, um, we went to Russian school. We went to Russian scouts. You know, we were brought up American. I'm sorry, Russian. 
Um, you know, San Francisco was like a coincidence. Um, and, and I really just, I didn't like that. Um, and until I started um, writing this book and thinking about that, and I actually went to the refugee camp we lived in and started seeing it from his point of view, I didn't understand my father or what was going on. And I really uh, resented being Russian. Um, so going to Russia for me was like an act of penance. Um, that's what I was doing. I was gonna go learn about the country my father came from with my Russian family and understand what happened to the people who left, what happened to the people who stayed, how did I relate to Russia? Um, and um, what happened was the most incredible experience because for those of us who grew up in Russian San Francisco, our concept of Russia was so biased, but we didn't know it. Um, and, um, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, we thought all the Russians were thrilled. Um, and at one point in my book, I even wrote about um, uh, Ronald Reagan talking about the evil empire. Uh, and at some point, we talked about that when I was in Russia, and the family we visited with, uh, Ira Amachayeva, was just, she was shocked that somebody would call it that. And it was really interesting to start understanding in a slightly less biased way who they were and what they understood. They didn't go through Stalin. They were too young to have lived through all that. Um, so to them, the Soviet Union was not what I thought it was. And it was very interesting to travel and learn about it. So the family we were visiting were Artyom, who was about 30, his younger brother, and then his parents, Ira and Igor, Irina and Igor, who were in their 50s uh, and six, approaching 60. And my brother and I are around 70. My cousin is, in her, is around 60. Their kids are 30 and 28. So we had the generations that grew up after communism died, Artyom and my cousin Katze, uh, then the other generations. This is a picture of Tsar Alexander, Emperor Alexander, Tsar Nicholas, and Ksenia, the, his sister, so the princess of Russia. Um, and this is, you know, a, a picture of a slightly earlier era than the one I showed of my grandmother, but that's the Romanov family um, that I write about in the book. Of uh, my family and Artyom's family in Russia when we first got there. There I am, this is my brother, this is my cousin Vita, Victor, Lena, Helen, Katya, and Kolya. So these are the Americans, and this is Igor, Ira, Irina, and Artyom. So those are the Russians, so the, the two Amachayev families. It's 11 o'clock at night, we have just shown up from the airport, and Ida is feeding us the same way my mother would have fed us if we had come home, uh, you know, with guests at 11 o'clock at night. I'm going to read you um, one of the first conversations we had with them. The relaxed comfort that shows on our faces is real. From the moment of our first meeting, there is not a hint of awkwardness, just ease and familiarity that is to dominate our visit. We aren't here to debate political tensions between our countries. We just want to connect with people whose lives might have been ours in different circumstances. And they have welcomed six complete strangers into their home as though we really were a family. In one of our first extended conversations, Igor learns that my cousins are avid singers. Igor says that he too loves music and is interested in learning what they like to sing. Vita talks about retiring from his job as a banker and how he is now free to dedicate himself to developing his voice so he can take solos in the choir at the Holy Virgin Russian Orthodox Cathedral in San Francisco. When he and Lena are home with friends, he says, they drink vodka and sing old Russian folk songs. So what are some of your favorite songs? I ask Igor, 
as Vitsa pauses in his story. Did you all sing the old Russian favorites when you were young? Igor stares at us for a while before finally responding. Well, no, he says. I liked Springsteen and Pink Floyd and Elton John. And now we all stare at him. He tells us he doesn't know any of our old Russian favorites. They weren't part of his growing up. He grew up in the Soviet Union of the 70s and 80s, and they listened to the same music that played on our radios and televisions at that time. Why would he be interested in some prehistoric Russian songs that the old people used to sing in the days before radio and television even existed? More importantly, he wonders, why would we? Our conversation starts an exploration of the differences in our expectations of each other. Igor is stunned at our Russianness. Artem could not believe we spoke Russian. They are now learning it goes far beyond language. And they have more questions than we can answer in one evening, or maybe ever. Why, they wonder, is there a Russian community in America that keeps all this ancient history alive? Why are we part of it? I can feel Igor's mind trying to fathom this unusual situation. Perhaps he is also wondering about spending the next few weeks with people who are this weird. What has he signed up for? Who has his son brought into their lives? Certainly there were no churches around in the days of his youth and they didn't have choirs or sing prayers in elaborate harmony. While we delayed our arrival in Russia because Russian Easter was so late this year, it is clear the Amachayevs in Russia did not join in this ritual. Easter is not an important concept in their lives. Vitsa and Lena also celebrated his mom's names day, and it doesn't escape them that our hostess's full name is also Irina. Again, Ida is oblivious to this event, even though she graciously accepts their good wishes on it, as she accepts everything about us. We discover they still don't even celebrate Christmas much, 30 years after religion returned to their country after the fall of communism in 1989. When we are surprised at that, they tell us New Year's Day is the best holiday and invite us to come visit and celebrate that with them this year. But that's the middle of winter, Sasha says, my brother. Napoleon was defeated by Moscow's winter. Who would dare come visit then? Oh, we could spend hours in the banya. You would love it, Igor rhapsodizes, smiling as he always does when talking about one of his favorite haunts. So that's how we began our trip. And uh, we had a, just a wonderful time um, sharing as if we were family. And, we were family, we're Amachayevs. We learned that, you know, our families came from near each other, but we'd never met before. And it was really quite magical. And so they, their dacha, which is a summer cottage, um, is near Moscow and uh, places in, in Russia that are full of churches um, and are quite incredibly beautiful. Um, it's like, one church piled on after another in, in gorgeous, gorgeous little towns. Um, and we just had a wonderful time exploring. But then our mission was to go to the village where my father was born, which, as I said, Artsom had told us was near where his grandfather was born. And so we were on a mission to explore where those villages were, how close they were, and to try to find people who knew both our families uh, to see if we were related. Now, this is my concept of what is called an izba, which is what my family had. And my uncle, you know, had fabulous memories of the izba where he was born in a town called Kulikov. So they were Don Cossack. They came from the south of Russia. And Kulikov was, a, it's not even a town. It's a tiny village of less than a thousand people. I had been there in 1977 in the middle of communism, and I did find the house um, where they were born. This is the house 
and this is actually, I just realized that the Ambad, the grain storage house, um, because my grandfather, who had been a Kazakh and a peasant, had become what was later called a Pulak. He was a successful grain merchant, and that's where he stored grain. So this was the house that we were looking for in this little remote village, nowhere in Russia. And we drove there and we walked around and we looked for this village and thank God we gave ourselves two days because we couldn't find anything. And finally, the second day, we found the house that my father was born in. And I'm not gonna tell you the drama because it's a great story of how we found it, but I am gonna show it to you and you'll understand why we couldn't find it. So this, like this, is a typical izba. They're wooden, they have these beautiful windows. Uh, they're typically got blue, that's, this is a crem crummy old picture, but even, you know, this, this was built by my grandfather for my grandmother when they got married. So it was built in 19, between 1905 and 1910. Um, and so by 77, it was pretty worn down. But here it is now. And we kept saying that wasn't the right house, it's brick. And finally, somebody explained to us, when these old izbas start rotting, they get covered in brick. And um, so we finally had to accept that, yes, this was definitely the same house. It was in exactly the same spot. The same road was still there. The same nothing was still all around. And this was our house. And I ended up, for the first time in my life and only time, I think, going inside that house. Um, and, you know, my grandmother always talked about that house. My uncle thought it was two stories tall. When I got there, they said, there's never been a two story tall house in the village, but he was just so proud of that house that to him, it was two stories tall. So I finally went inside and, you know, they have a baby and it's a horrible mess and the wife was gone and the husband let me in. But I think it looks magical. So to me, it looks like a beautiful house with these curtains that I grew up with that, you know, my grandmother wouldn't have considered a house that didn't have curtains if she could possibly get them. And all of a sudden, when I looked at this, I thought, oh my God, now I get what it was that she left. She had just achieved this. They left in 1919. So you know, the house was, she'd been married for less than 10 years um, and they had to abandon everything. I mean, it, it was really tragic and seeing this reminded me of it or made me understand it. The other thing that, made, that it made me understand was this little baby that, that lives here was crying and was there all the time. He's about a year old. And I thought, you know, that baby's not gonna remember that some American woman showed up in his house. Um, and that's how old my father was when they fled. And I thought, I mean, there's just no way that he's gonna remember this. So in a weird way, he carried Russia with him, but he couldn't have possibly really remembered it. So it was all created um, for him by his family in flight. So um, then while we were there, not 200 yards from this house, Igor, suddenly finds his grandmother's grave. And this is the gravestone. This is his grandmother. This is his Aunt Fina. I later learned that this is his great grandmother. He didn't even know who that was. Um, and, and another young relative. And he found this completely by accident. He had no idea that his grandmother was buried 200 yards from the house that my father was born in. And they were born in what was called a kolkhoz, a community uh, farm that they were forced into by the communists in the 20s. And so it's very clear that they came from this village, moved to one two kilometers away, um, and that we're related. But the problem was, we can't figure out how. Um, my grandfather had nine brothers and sisters. My grandmother had four. Nobody's ever heard or seen from any of them. Um, you know, they were Amachayevs, but he was Ivan Minayevich. We have not found any other Amachayevs, even in that time frame, uh, with that record. All the records were destroyed by the communists. They wiped out the Kazakhs completely. Um, and so we, we just lost all that. 
but to find that told us we were family and we still feel very closely linked. Um, and we, I did sneak DNA testing um, into um, Russia. And um, so we did, we did do the test and uh, I did sneak it back out, their spit back out into America um, so we could learn more about it. Um, so that was um, that. And then the other thing that was most amazing is I didn't know until, my father didn't know until I went to Russia that there's a village that used to be called Amachayev. And now everything has ski added to it. So this, this in Russian says Amachayev ski. And we could not believe we were driving down the freeway and found the village of Amachayev ski. Um, but just so that we uh, didn't get too excited, <laughs> this is Amachayevsky and one of the, you know, 12 remaining people who live there. Um, and, you know, this is his house. Uh, this is what that village looks like. Um, and here's another example of it. And here's a woman who is uh, farming. And this is the status of farming in this country in 2020, 2019. Um, so it was wonderful to visit my cousin Vitsa uh, right here. Decided to learn how to use this thing and broke it. <laughs> so we were really a nightmare, but we had a wonderful time. She was very sweet. And they're moving in. They came from like Tajikistan or somewhere. I can't, Kazakhstan maybe. Um, and that's who's coming back to that area. The Kazakhs are gone. It's hollowed out. Um, but it's, it's fine land. It's, it's great farming land. Something's going to happen eventually. Um, after we found the house where we were born, after we visited where um, their family came from, after we found the, the uh, cemetery, we were heading for Crimea. And the reason we were heading for Crimea was that that's where they departed Russia. Um, and it's um, the most incredible thing is they left Russia 100 years ago this week, um, November 13th, 1920. Um, it, it's absolute incredible coincidence that I'm writing this book exactly 100 years uh, after that event. And the State Department told us not to go, that it was very dangerous to go to Crimea. I mean, we, you know, the situation is tenuous. Um, but as I wrote to a friend, I said, I don't have time to wait for the politics to get better. Russian American politics have been pretty terrible for a long time. And I don't think they're getting better soon. And I'm going to see um, where my family left from. And so we did go to Crimea. Um, we had an amazing time. And um, when my uncle was in his 80s, my cousin sat him down. His sister was visiting from Serbia. They sat down and she recorded them talking about their flight from Russia. They left that house that you saw. They got into what's called a tilega, which is like a, a four wheel cart with a horse pulling it. Um, they traveled for a year through the countryside down to Crimea. And then he described the house that their father got them into. And it was a baronial dwelling and he went on and on and on. But he described exactly where it was. And so I went crazy in um, Yevpatoria, which is a small town in Crimea. It was one of three departure points. There were only three or four ships who came to that particular port. Um, and they, that's where they waited to find out what was going on. And um, that was where the white Russian army was. They still thought they might win, but it was pretty slim. And there was a early cold winter. The link between Russia and Crimea froze and the Red Army just came over. And that was the end of it. And they evacuated uh, in two days. And so um, we actually found what we believe is the house where they lived. Uh, and this is a house right on the docks of Yevpatoria. Um, and uh, this is the other side. Um, this is what it now looks like. Uh, you know, it's not in great shape, but based on everything we knew, and, and there's a museum there that tells you a little bit more, this is where they were 
and this is where they left from. Um, and it was extremely um, touching uh, and significant to find that. Um, so that was um, the end of that part of the trip. And then we went back to Moscow, um, Moskva. Uh, and um, and what, what was very interesting about visiting Moscow was, was many things, but one of them is, and again, I went there in 1977. Um, Zarina, I know you lived there, but you know, it, it, it was so bad. It was so ugly. The stores were, you know, empty. Um, the buildings were run down. It was appalling. And all of a sudden, I'm in Moscow, and it's like an elaborate version of Paris. Um, and uh, so I'll just show you a couple of pictures. You know, it's probably fixed up, but this was alive and well, uh, even during communism. But here, I think this is Goom Department Store. And, uh, you know, when I went to Goom, it was like you waited in line for nothing um, and you couldn't buy much. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, this is a store. Um, this is the view of Moscow from one of the bridges over the river. And uh, you can see, you know, the, the Kremlin and, uh, you know, I don't think I'm the only one who thinks this is impressive. I could not believe this city. It just went on and on. Um, and this is Yelisevsky uh, grocery store. Um, and again, it was, um, oh, what were they called? Uh, Zarina, I forgot right now. Gastronom. Gastronom, exactly. <laughs> they were all called gastronom and they had a number. You know, imagine you walk into grocery store number five and you see this. Um, it, it's quite incredible. Um, Moscow was so over the top. So, okay. And when I went to Moscow in 1977, for the equivalent of about 0 0.02 cents, I stayed in one of the finest hotels and I decided I was staying there again. And they somehow looked me up and figured out that I was an author called Tanya Romanova. And in Russia, they idolize the royalty. And so they would not believe me that I was a peasant Romanova. And so this is my suite in the hotel and that's the view I had. And they sent champagne so that's my cousin and myself having champagne in the royal suite um, where I stayed for a few days. It was really quite incredible. The final thing that I want to talk about is the, one of the last things that happened in Russia. My cousin went into every church because they're religious and they're church people. I am so unreligious, but I do love churches. And I found this little church that I went into. And um, I'm gonna show you a picture of this little church and this woman. That's woman number two. And this is the church. It's a tiny little church, um, but I loved it. I thought it was really sweet. And as you can see, I took pictures. Um, and so um, woman number one, was really sweet. Her name was Lena also. And she was just warm and welcoming. Woman number two said, you're not allowed to take pictures. And uh, so I thought, oh, oh God. And, um, and then uh, the first woman said, oh, you could take pictures if you got permission. Now, mind you, I do speak Russian. But nevertheless, even though I speak Russian and I understand it, you know, there are expressions that mean something slightly different than what you think. But she told me to get the, the uh, priest's blessing. I went to get the priest's blessing. So I'm gonna read you about that experience. Um, I waited in front of a small room and then I was let in. A small room so beautiful, it screams to be memorialized, awaits me. A heavy set elderly priest with a bushy beard sits on a bench that lines the left wall. He wears a long black robe and a large cross hangs on his chest. I sit next to him and look into his eyes, wondering what I am supposed to do. 
He marks the sign of a cross in front of my face. I bow my head briefly. We stare at each other a few more moments. Tell me your problems, he finally says in Russian. Oh, I don't have any problems. I'm visiting the land my father came from, I say, beaming at him. I'm from America. I share a brief version of my story with him. He keeps looking at me, then finally tells me to hold God in my heart all the time. Something about him reaches deep into me, and I reach out to hug him. Suddenly, I wonder if this is even allowed. I had abandoned religion after many battles with the priest who taught me in Russian school when I was young. The final straw was when I thought I won the fight about non-believers going to hell. Not quite. But for sure, they will have to come around in order to leave purgatory, he finished, taking the last word. But I was finished with him. And now I plan to hug a priest? Mojna, may I, I ask, as my arms stop in midair? A huge grin pushes its way through me as I catch his eyes again. He silently wraps his arms around me and holds me in a deep embrace for a long time. When I pull away and beam at him again, he says, bring that joy with you wherever you go. Bring your smile, make people rejoice. Make them leave happier than before they saw you. And I wondered how this man read my mission in life in that one instant. Outside, the woman in blue smiles at me, and I head off to take images. The one who told me I couldn't shakes her finger at me again. I saw the batushka, I say, using a priestly title meant for six-year-olds. Batushka Nikolai Blagoslavil, she asks. Oh, yes, I tell her. The father certainly blessed me. After she leaves, I realize I was supposed to get his blessing for taking pictures, not for my soul. Absorbing the experience takes much longer. It was a Saturday, and the women were waiting for confession so they could go to communion at the service on Sunday. When I was a child, we had to take confession at least once a year during Easter Lent, a prerequisite for communion. I would invent bad things, for I wasn't going to share my truths with a priest. I never shared my innermost secrets with anyone, and I certainly wasn't about to start in church. And now I understood that I was supposed to tell the Bible my sin, my story. The objective of the ritual is absolution. It is about redemption and forgiveness. The very thing I had gone to my homeland in search of. I almost blew it, but I didn't. Batushka Nikolai's Blagoslovenia will always be with me. When I describe this scene to Igor and Ida, they can't stop laughing. Igor has watched me hug policemen, Crimean Tatari, total strangers. Of course, Artanya would hug a priest, he says. Well, that's a fascinating book. And um, does it come with photographs? It does come with photographs. And uh, they are black and white. And if you go on my website, you can also see the color photographs. Um, and I think if you do, uh, Kindle, you can see the photographs in color. Right. I actually don't remember, but for sure on my website. We carry Tanya's books at Globus Books, so if you want a physical copy, make sure to stop by. We are, currently they are in the window shop on display, and they are beautiful books indeed. Uh, but it was very special to see the photos and hear the stories behind them and how the book came to be. Um, and by the way. When we have the Russian version, it's going to be at Globus. Wonderful. We can't wait. That, that's fascinating. Yeah. And I know there will be a lot of people who would prefer to hear these stories in Russian, both in Russia or immigrants. Uh, we have the whole section 
on immigrant history. Uh, there's a big shelf in the back of the store and we have all sort of life stories and family trees and uh, biographies and you would see stories of people in Harbin and Russians in Africa and of course in Europe anyway you name it that <laughs> there are stories from all over the world so certainly yours belong there as well that that shelf is in Russian and we have right. yours book and some other ones in English as well. Uh, it's certainly a very interesting uh, subject for conversation. We actually had uh, the senior archaeologist of the state of California um, come and speak to us at Globus about the migration of the Russians through Harbin. The same, the right. Bela Russians, the, not the yellow Russians, but the Bela Russians, right. the, the white <laughs> Russians who fought the Bolsheviks. They, they all fled through the east, far east right. of Russia, and they found themselves in China. Uh, and then they had to immigrate again and actually a part of my family uh came that way they came through carbine and right. san francisco in the um in 20s and 30s i believe quite a lot of them so yeah i grew up with a lot of them a lot of them fled when uh, the communists took over china so it was really a similar time to my family yeah um, yeah, they had to flee again. And the photographs that uh, Brack shared during that show, which you can watch on YouTube as well, um, they are in a way similar to the first sets of photographs that you shared uh, with your family. They all look very strict and you could kind of see that the years of journey and the, everything that they had to go through in their faces. They, and they also are very religious. That, that's one thing that they share in common. Tanya, I, I've loved hearing about your book and uh, many stories of the various families and coincidences in, in the book. Um, one thing you, you talk about is really finding your father's Russia, and you talk about the experience both you and he have an experience as in being exiled and being refugees. Um, uh, but at the same time, your grandmother, the, a lot of the beginning of the book talks about your grandmother and her history, and she also was exiled twice, you know, similar to your father, but even twice as an adult. And how do you think the, that experience, you know, impacted her? Uh, you, you describe her as a very strong personality to start with, but um, can you yeah. talk about some of your thoughts on that? Well, that's a great question. You know, it's taken me a lifetime to understand my father. Now you're asking about my grandmother. <laughs> it could take another lifetime. Um, she was an extremely strict person. And, um, and she was, to be honest, she was fairly mean with me. Um, and so I really... I was close to her because she was my caregiver when we came to America, but I was also, you know, distanced from her. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. She uh, never moved to America. It, it, she simply, she was not in America. She was, I think she was still in Russia, even in San Francisco. All her friends were Russian. She never learned a word of English. Um, and uh, she went to the Russian church. Um, and I, it was, I remember when I was um, in grammar school, junior high school, I was so mortified about being Russian. I mean, today, what a gift to speak Russian. But then, oh my God, I was mortified. And we had a telephone and the phone would ring and my grandmother, bless her soul, as long as she could move a step, she wanted to be the one to pick up that phone. And it was always, yes, we'll show you. You know, and my seventh grade friends would be thinking, what the hell have I reached? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and she would refuse to give you the phone and they would sort of stutter and hang up and then you had to race her for it. But she was just, you know, that's who she was. And really all her friends, that generation, that's who they were. Um, America meant nothing to them. You know, my parents all had to learn English. They, they would all like, the main reason, they had two reasons to learn English. Um, one was to pass a driver's test and one was to get their uh, citizenship. And uh, for the driver's test, you know, that you have those questions you have to fill out. Well, you used to be able to keep those, 
and they would exchange them with each other and they would practice and study. Um, and so that, that was the big deal. In fact, I know this is off subject, but my mother took that test any number of times. And one time she came home and she was so pissed because she had missed it by one question. And uh, she said, the question was, what is an island? And she said, an island is a body of land in the middle of the ocean. And she said, I was wrong. They said it was a piece of cement in the middle of the street. <laughs> and so she failed the test. But, um, but yeah, my grandmother's generation, they, um, you know, now that I think about it, I think um, she never really adapted even to Yugoslavia. She thought of that as temporary. They left Russia on a temporary basis. They, they had Russian schools set up by Yugoslavia. They were called corpuses. There were Russian military academies um, because they all expected that they were going back. The, the czar's family. So um, even today, I am sure that Marina knows who in her family would be the next czar. She's the closest living relative of Tsar Nicholas II, but she's a woman, so that, that's irrelevant. But somewhere there is a man, I forgot his name, there's a, a, an organization that still tracks who would be the next czar. But of course, as I write in my book, the current czar of Russia is Putin. And uh, I don't think he's putting a Romanov <laughs> in his place in the near future. But yes, so thank you. There's an interesting connection actually because um, the founder of Globus uh, from the very beginning, and that was in uh, 1971, Vladimir Azar. He comes from the similar background. His parents immigrated from uh, Russia, I believe, St. Petersburg, and settled in Yugoslavia, and he went one of these corpuses. So, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know what's very interesting is because of these Zoom calls, I'm starting to meet people who have the same background. There's a woman from uh, near Minnesota who's going to connect um, on my next call. Um, I met a woman from Belarus just a few days ago. So it's, it's, you know, there's a bubbling of people with that same background. Right. I was just curious, Tanya, you mentioned, uh, you know, when you had that sort of cultural surprise when you when you started singing, when you and the, the Russian family that you were visiting, you started comparing songs and you were surprised that they hadn't, they didn't still sit around singing the old Russian songs. And you said they were really surprised to find out that in the United States, and in this case in San Francisco, that you still preserved that quote unquote old Russian culture. Right. So I'm just curious, what did you, when they asked you, why do you guys preserve that? Why are you still doing that? Why are you still singing these songs and these traditions that to us are from the Stone Ages? What was your response to them? Well, it's very interesting. So one thing about Russian people in Russia, and again, Zarina can comment on this maybe more than I can. They do not pry no matter what. They ask nothing and they really share very little personal. And um, they would never dare ask us, why are you so Russian? Um, but what happened was over time, they actually started opening up to who we were in a really unique way. And um, I have uh, videos of us sitting in a kitchen in Crimea singing Russian songs. And final, and my, I'm telling you, my relatives are amazing singers. And finally, there's Igor, and he's got his phone, and his phone has the Russian words to these old songs, and he's singing them. And then we go to this, we are having dinner in an inn, and uh, this woman is there, and her daughter is a singer. So she's really into music. And again, we all start singing. And this woman is in tears, and she cannot believe that we have brought Russia back to her. And they feel like they lost something. And they're thrilled that, you know, we came back to share it with them. So, I, you know, we never explain why, because I can't possibly imagine why, but it's, um, it turned into something very warm and positive uh, and heartwarming. Um, but to watch Igor, who is so neutral, 
um, warm up was beautiful. And um, there's something in Russian called a charachka. Um, and charachka maya is a song that you sing and you hold a glass, a shot glass of vodka on a pedestal and you sing this song charachka maya and I'm tone deaf, but you sing it to somebody that you honor. Um, and so in this little restaurant in Crimea, my cousin and her husband did the charachka for Igor. And I promise you, he got close to tears. And he is the most straight man you've ever met in your life. And so I just feel like maybe we never answered the question, but we showed them the power of the connection that we have and the value of it. And I learned the value of it. That's one of the things I write in the book is that I gave up all that. I, I just, you know, moved away from it. And so it was traveling to Russia with my family that brought me back to understanding what a gift we've carried for a hundred years. I'll be damned if I know why or how, but it is an unbelievable gift and I'm grateful now. Yeah, I have a comment on that um, because what happens in immigration and not just for Russians immigrating to the United States, but for all sort of immigrants, they take with them culture and they preserve it. So it's in a way, it's marinated in a way, yes. you know, it's like this mushrooms in a jar, in a glass jar. So when you are talking about the son charich Kamaya, you understand that it dates back hundred years and it did not survive all the revolutions and wars. Nobody has ever heard that song back then right. in any kind of close to modernity. It's yeah. antiquated. It's something coming from there, yeah. but because it was preserved and in a way your grandparents' generation and some of your parents' generation were secluded and they, 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 they had this environment in which the language survived, which did not uh, back in Russia because the language is an alive being, it changes. Right. It, it, so it mutated there like any alive language, but it is preserved here. So I think it's a, in addition to being a gift to you, it's a gift to linguists. Right, <laughs> right. No, I think they, you're right. In a way, that's the language of Bunin and our classical literature that you speak when you speak Russian. It's different from right. the Russian that I speak. And the Russian that I speak is different from the alive Russian that they speak in Moscow now because I left 20 years ago and there are new words. Our intonations are different, pronunciation is different. And there are a lot of things that I don't understand already. And it's not such yeah. a long time. So it's, it's fascinating from the uh, anthropological point of view, from linguistic point of view. There's so much to study in this phenomenon. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And by the way, just so you know, I edited the Russian version of the book and I had to read it several times because first I had to understand it was a different Russian. And um, so I had to read it to say, does it reflect what I meant? And, um, you know, it's not the way I would say it, but I needed to learn that. And so I would ask questions and they would say, yeah, no, that's good. Or no, you found something that we should change. But it wasn't black and white because it's a different language. And the funniest part was, you know, my Russian is, it, it's fine, but I haven't used it for many, many years. My dad died in 87. That's the last person I spoke Russian with. You know, my cousin's Russian is really strong. She read the Russian version and she just couldn't believe it. She said, you're gonna let them publish that? I said, why not? She said, it sounds so weird. I said, no, that's the language that they speak. You know, you're the one who speaks a weird Russian. It's not Tolstoy anymore. Well, yeah, I agree with you. I sometimes find the written texts that come in from there at my work because we work with Moscow a lot and uh, I find them questionable and it's just, again, just... <laughs> See, yeah. you're already a different Russian, as you yeah, said. Well, this, you have to understand that the uh, uh, technology revolution, in a way, the whole information era yeah. changed 
the language drastically because there are a lot of words and concepts that, that were brought in that um, uh, echo in English words and they are now acceptable and they were not acceptable before the internet was there, uh, widely used. So that, that has changed a lot. Plus a lot of political changes and just time. I think that's, that's what happens. I mean, I, I'm a, a linguist uh, and literary scholar by education. And we studied that, we studied. Right. The, well, I can't wait to hear what you think of the Russian version of the book. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would be very interested to see it and to give it a read, of course. And uh, it was also interesting, Tanya, uh, that you said that you found Russian people very modest, shy, who would not pry. That is entirely different, A, from the stereotype that exists, and B, from my uh, whole life experience of living there. Traditionally, your family is perhaps very different because traditionally, especially after a charachka of vodka involved, right. <laughs> you, know, you have no boundaries. And I, I don't know if you've ever been on a night train from Moscow to St. Petersburg, where people, tend to tell each other their whole life stories and oversharing to an extent that would make any uh, American just flee the train. <laughs> it's, no, but I guess I'm gonna have to do that. <laughs> uh, maybe they were cautious in some way because you're a new relative. I don't know, It's I found it very interesting and different from m my experience. <laughs> okay, I will tell you one thing. You'll see there's a chapter in my book about um, uh, Zhenya. And uh, it's to the point that I, Zhenya is an invented name. Um, and he is a man who shared tremendously with me. And he was drunk out of his mind. So <laughs> I can relate to that part. <laughs> but the sober ones were really restrained. And they would never criticize America. I had to be at a party drunk with an American who lived there, a, a Russian American, to learn what they really thought of us. They were extremely polite. That's, that was just my experience. That's very nice. I had heard from you, Tanya, that you said you, when you were reading the Russian version, whether it was with your cousin or somebody, and there was a, a um, an introduction to it, oh, right. that it came, that you found that there were some really interesting insights in that introduction. Is there anything that you can think of that would be yeah. interesting to share? Ivan Kurila, who's a professor of Russian-American relations in uh, St. Petersburg, wrote the foreword. And in English, there's a difference between an introduction and a foreword. And a foreword is something that is written by a, an educated expert um, to introduce your work. And when I read that forward, first of all, it's about four or five pages long. And when I read it in Russian, my reaction was, I'm not sure I would read the book if I had read this first, because it was so complex. And then I just ran it through Google Translate, and all of a sudden, I was like married to it. I was like, I can't wait to see the Russian version because it's so wonderful. And then I was willing to spend six hours reading it and understanding it. Um, and he really, he understood me better than I understood myself writing that book. It was incredible. He talked about the fact that I, I was realized, I, I learned that I was the one who was ignorant about them rather than, you know, the other way around, um, and that I needed to learn who the Russians were um, as much as they wanted to learn who we were. But, and then he also really talked about the fact that this is a story of memory. And, you know, there's pure memory that is unfiltered by the government, and then there's memory that's filtered by the government. You know, and, and in a sense, in Russia, so much of the memory was so clearly filtered by the government, but it's really true everywhere at all times. And he was really good at, at talking about that. So he just, um, he was able to pull some things out uh, that are incredible. I mean, you're going to get a copy of it. Um, I could send it to you in Russian, but it was so deep. Um, so this man read this book, thought about it, 
and then sort of talk through, you know, what was this author trying to say? One of the things that was really important and challenging um, with this whole book, really important and really challenging, I had to keep it politically neutral. Um, I'm writing a book about a Russian family that I didn't know and that I'm traveling through Russia with. And the last thing I want to do is politicize it. Um, and so to write the book in a way that was, didn't sound like an idiot, but was politically neutral, was really something that was important and challenging um, and, and that, you know, that felt good. Um, because when I write a book like this, everybody who is mentioned in it gets to review it and approve it, you know, if they so choose. But I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Um, and so that was really a good lesson, a really powerful lesson in learning how to do that. Because we all have biases, I mean, no question. Um, and, and so I have very few political statements, you know, very few. They're, they're sprinkled through there, but not much. How long did it take you to write this book, Tanya? You know, it really took no time at all. It's shocking. Um, I finished Mother Tongue, you know, in, in uh, the middle of 2018. Um, and we left for Russia in, in May of 2019. And by the time I left, I had already written the book all the way up to the leaving Russia. So I had finished the whole story of my grandmother. And then I wrote, I write while I travel. So I would write every morning. My cousin, uh, Victor Vitsa, just read the book as soon as it came out. And he said, oh my God, he said, everything you wrote about our trip is so accurate. I was there with you. He said, did you stay up all night and write? You know, how did you do this? Um, and it turns out I talk while I'm walking. So I love to walk and I talk into my phone and it writes everything down. Um, and so the book wrote itself almost. Um, and probably the hardest part was writing the beginning because in the, in the end, what I did was I put the story about Marina Romanova in the very beginning and the story about Artyom. So you get the introduction of why this book is about three different families. Um, and then I did things like um, when I write about um, so my family leaves in 1920, and then I write about what happens to the village after they leave, to the, to the sorry, Hutter, after they leave. And, um, and it's completely obviously invented, but on the other hand, it's based on history and truth. I did a huge amount of research on what happened and when. And um, so um, Atzom's great-grandfather was Alexei, and um, my grandmother rejected Mikhail Amachayev, and uh, his cousin was Alexei Amachayev. And I spent a long time trying to decide which one of those was going to be their great grandfather. Um, and I finally decided it was Alexei, which was the appropriate name. Um, and he was a red sympathizer who ended up suffering terribly. Um, but um, he moved to the, his family moved to the Kalhoz when it was created. And um, so I wrote this whole story about it. And then I sent it to Artem. I said, you need to run this by your father. I want to make sure they accept him as, as you know, your great grandfather. They, and they wrote back and they said, absolutely, he's ours. Because <laughs> you had to decide, was he a white sympathizer? Was he a red? Did he change? When? And all this was going on nonstop. And, you know, who got wiped out? Because most of them got wiped out. You know, there were 2 million Cossacks. When they were done, there were 150,000. That was a pretty dramatic cut. Um, so anyway, that, that was an interesting process and, and, uh, and one that I enjoyed. But I actually enjoyed writing the book tremendously and it, it did not take long. I guess it just needed to come out. And then, and the other part was that I did figure out what it was about as I was writing it. Um, and really the, the thing with the priest, which to me is one of the most significant things, really sank in um, deep. And, and I really did, I feel at peace with my father, um, you know, and probably because it's coming out in Russia. <laughs> That's probably the ultimate gift I can give him. 
Fantastic. And these are the best books when they come out like they need to come out. This, these are the only good books, really, in my experience. Of course, editing and rewriting and thinking about them could be a long and torturous process, but it, there has to be this core there, which yeah. it is the inner need. And that, that, that is the bottom line here. So congratulations, Tanya. Uh, it's a wonderful talk. I love the photographs. Um, I would love to see more photographs when you present your Russian version of the book too. I think they're very well done too. And um, there's certainly something about the villages and the abandoned villages, dying villages of the middle of Russia that has this poignant beauty to us. It doesn't yeah. have they these villages don't have the point and beauty to the people who live there to the villages it's a very harsh life i know yeah. that because when i was little um, my grandfather owned an isba a wooden hut in karelia we were not from there but he was an artist and so he mm -hmm. was given it as a studio and we would spend the whole summer there but it was just the three uh, wooden huts from the 17th century and a wooden church and there was no electricity no running water just wells the objects that you've shown uh in the photographs i remember those it's called the casa so it's that's what oh, yeah that's a tool you use to cut grass if you choose to most people don't cut any grass so, or wheat right. Uh, and right. uh it was very like caveman existence uh, and right. Uh, right. I remember that very well. And this this village doesn't exist anymore because there were three old babushkas and they were dead. And then some drunkards burned down the church and the whole place is gone. So um, it's good to know that people are moving in and they, they're coming back yeah. to life. And it's a long and torturous journey back to life. Can I tell you one more story? Of course. You just triggered me on it. So, Kasa is that long thing. So, the last translation I just read, uh, the final edit, uh, they had a problem with what I wrote at the end, and it was about that thing. So, hammer and sickle, what is that in Russian? Uh, serp i molot. Molot, the other way, molot is serp, sickle is, yeah, is well, it? Serp and so serp the is the cutting thing. Okay. Right. Only so I short. Okay, that's the problem. So to me, that was a serp. And they wrote and they, and so what I did is I tried kind of a not very nice statement that said, you know, Russia has maybe come a long way, but you know, the hammer and sickle was there in a hundred years ago, and this woman is still using it to cut the grass and they said you've got the wrong device that wasn't a sickle that was a scythe even in english we have two words um and they edited it so elegantly that they somehow left my comment in but sort of made it say you could take it for a sickle um they just they corrected what i did so carefully and so elegantly that I was impressed. That's amazing that you you recognize the side uh, that she was using, and they're yeah. still using it. We had them in the in the back of the behind the haystacks, and when she's still cutting grass with it, you know, uh, I can surprise you, or maybe not after what you've seen. But I I used to carry the buckets from the well on a special device called Karamisla, which for the life of me, I don't think it even exists here. Uh, and I, when I was an adult already, because in the other village at the Dutch where we left, we didn't have the running water. I had to carry those in the buckets. Right. So, and that was just very close to St. Petersburg. Um, well, that's the thing. You go to Par St. Petersburg or Moscow, and as I said, you're in a modern Paris, and you go 100 miles away, and you're in 200 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. And that's it's fun for us, you know, as tourists and visitors, uh, and one can, you know, only imagine what it is. <laughs> 
Well, terrific, terrific. Congratulations again. And come back with a Russian version and more photographs. And anybody who is interested in purchasing Tanya's books, not just that, but the whole trilogy or the Russian version, please contact us at Globus Books. Uh, if you're interested in the um, white Russian or immigration history, Sari's history, we're having another show coming uh, sometime soon in the uh, winter spring season which will be on the last Romanovs uh, the Romanovs uh, from the Tsarist dynasty uh, because we do have an expert on them living in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Anastasia Adel, and uh, she wrote about them quite a bit. And um, there's a family of the last surviving uh, descendants, descendants on the tsar, of the Tsars here in the States. So there will be a talk about that and the history and the last days of the Romanovs and come back and check our events on globusbooks.com. Uh, we have events being added all the time. Uh, subscribe to our channel and support your independent bookstores everywhere, not just Globus, but other bookstores. We are uh, struggling and buying books through independent bookstores uh, helps us a lot. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your questions. Thank you, Tanya. Congratulations again. And uh, we're wishing you a great Thank journey you. for your book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank great you. evening.